I'll spare you the Unbox Prawn and the Benchmark LARP. I mean a bit, and I'll get right down to it because the M1 Ultra is pretty much the ultimate expression of Apple's scalable silicon architecture and delivers on that promise almost linearly. And I'll get to why almost linearly in an Intel TJ Maxx hot minute right after I pull a Linus and thank today's sponsor, the Curiosity Stream and Nebula Bundle, which you should jump on faster than an M1 Ultra because I've got a whole new exclusive studio tour series already going up. But basically, if there's anything you couldn't do on an M1 Max MacBook Pro, if there were any limitations you were facing or walls you were just hitting up against, you can break right through them, most of them, with the M1 Ultra in the Mac Studio. Those limitations, those walls, like the Kool-Aid Man. Because where M1 Max had the exact same CPU and neural engines as the M1 Pro, albeit with double the potential GPU, media encoders, RAM, and memory bandwidth, M1 Ultra doubles everything, every core, every feature, everything down to the transistors to a ludicrous degree. I mean, we now have two secure enclaves, which I can only guess is like having two Klingon hearts and two iPhone 12 class image signal processors in a box with no cameras. But that's the only quasi dark matter compromise in what's otherwise a blindingly bright solution to making an already massively, massively monolithic die literally twice the size. Because that's what M1 Ultra is, two M1 Max dies joined together with a silicon interposer running 10,000 connections at 2.5 terabytes per second, basically an OG server farm worth of glue for double the CPU or four iStorm efficiency cores running at two gigahertz and 16 Firestorm performance cores running at 3.2 gigahertz spread across those two dies in two clusters each, giving us something we just never got with Intel Xeon in previous pro-level Macs, just massive multi-core parallelism without sacrificing single core performance, along with the ability to maintain that single core clock in one cluster, even if another has to down clock some to fire all the cores. I'd be tempted to say it's like having a carpool lane on the highway, but because Apple's performance controllers are just so damn good at dispatching between the various cores to begin with, and 800 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth is something we've only ever seen in high-end GPUs, never CPUs. So there's such low latency, even across dies, that it's virtually indistinguishable at the software level. Traffic is so highly optimized, it ends up being more like having a slipstream alongside a high fleet. So if you had any workloads that were purely or mostly CPU constrained, even on M1 Max, you're realistically throwing twice as many cores at any of those problems now. Also, there were 16 fourth generation Apple Neural Engines, or ANE, in A14, and 16 in every M1 through Max. But with double Max dies comes double ANE blocks. Also, double the AMX accelerators on the CPU and double the ML controllers for tying all of that together with the GPU for the core ML framework and making it all just double everything, basically. Just not in the exact same way as the GPU, which I'll get to in a second, because my understanding is that these two a &E blocks are still treated as two separate a &E targets by the system. That's just how the a &E blocks works. They are kingdoms unto themselves, which means multiple simultaneous ML workloads will get dispatched to both 16 core a &E blocks in parallel, resulting in potentially up to twice the throughput depending on the exact workloads, which could also ease a ton of bottlenecks if your workloads were really disparate before, whether that's training ML models or doing AI-based image or video enhancement. And of course, twice the G13 GPU cores, up to 64 of them now, 32 on each die. But thanks to Apple's metal frameworks and the ridiculous amount of bandwidth involved, those two blocks are presented as a single GPU to the system, not a single physical GPU, but as a software target just without all the latency and sync issues that have plagued previous interconnects and abstraction attempts. It's not quite linear. We're talking like 1.85 times, 1.9 times, which is pretty damn close. Also, where 128 gigabytes of RAM isn't out of the ordinary at all for a Mac CPU, especially not when the iMac Pro maxed out at 256 gigabytes and the current Xeon Mac Pro at 1.5 terabytes, but having 128 gigabytes of RAM available to the GPU is, I think, unprecedented. Like 3D models and environments at a size and with polygon counts and effects that you can load up and manipulate in real time in a way that just 
isn't possible on any other desktop box. The only major harsh in this mellow being, of course, that NVIDIA has CUDA cores and ray tracing and other features embraced by high-end gaming studios, and similarly, if not the same for AMD, along with DirectX and Vulkan, and Steam is making Proton work on the Steam Deck, where Apple is kind of stuck in metal, and if we build it, they'll come. Oh God, they'll come, won't they? I mean, we made snacks, they've gotta come. And even big games that get ported over to the iPhone and iPad, allow me to point you to any recent Dave 2D video, just aren't often making it to the Mac, even as check the box to let the iOS app run on the Mac ports. And since time may not be enough to fix that, if Apple really considers it important, they may have to flex their combined market share and more importantly, money, just all the money to Kaiser's so say single act of will it all to happen. Otherwise, just direct GPU to GPU compares are always gonna end up being apples to bananas. Then the double media engines, many of which were already doubled from the M1 Pro to the M1 Max and are double doubled in M1 Ultra, like your typical Tim Hortons order. Just, yes, Canadian humor, sorry. But that means twice the decode and encode accelerators for H.264 and HEVC and critical to higher end video work, ProRes, up to 18 simultaneous streams of AK ProRes to put an Apple number on it. And I know a lot of you audio techs and developers and game designers get super, super salty when every video you watch focuses almost completely on video. But one, that's not surprising from people whose job it is to make videos. And two, Apple is clearly focusing on video workloads with things like these dedicated media engines. And three, video production is really one of the very few things that actually lights up a ton of silicon with those media engines handling encode, decode, GPU handling effects and accelerating presentation, and CPU sometimes acting like a parent for metadata management, but also pitching in with the gnarlier camera codecs, the ones that aren't accelerated by the media engines. It's a perfect storm of pain for modern compute systems and one that Apple is actually turning into more than a bit of pleasure with their custom silicon. You also get double the IO controllers for a total of six USB and six Thunderbolt for just a ton of ports on the Mac Studio. Four Thunderbolt slash USB-C, 10 gigabit ethernet, no MagSafe, alas, like the M1 iMac because no external power brick like the M1 iMac, which MagSafe requires. Two USB-A, an HDMI 2.0 on the back, and then two more USB-C or Thunderbolt ports along with an SDXC card reader. But this is one of the very few areas where I don't think we're seeing real linear scalability. From M1 Max to M1 Ultra, the two USB-C ports on the front do benefit by becoming full-on Thunderbolt, so you can drive a display right in the front if you want to. But the card reader on the front remains SDXC and UHS-2, and the HDMI port on the back remains 2.0. No bump up to SDUC and UHS-3, never mind the kind of CF Express cards that I'm using these days, or HDMI 2.1, which is, yes, an absolute joke of a mess of a standard at this point, but would allow for even more bandwidth, meaning even higher resolutions and frame rates among other amenities. And it could just be that M1 planning was long enough out that those standards lack the popularity and maturity to be considered for Apple Silicon round one. But it's hard to be super crusty about them because if you do want them, you can just dongle up a type C port to get them. And as any working pro knows, standards evolve often enough and perplexingly enough that you can never, not ever really live a dongle free life. Now, OG M1, the original M1 Prime was itself transformative. It focuses on performance through efficiency meaning this no longer little grown up from iPhone and iPad chip runs just ridiculously cooler than Intel and AMD's shrunk down from enterprise server chips. So it gets profoundly better battery life in the same enclosure for portables and can enable enclosures that simply weren't thermally possible before, even for desktops. And it has better performance than many chips that consume way, way more wattage, meaning it gets workloads done faster, saving you dozens of minutes out of every hour, every day, like I hit render on a video, I go to get a cup of coffee and it's done so fast, I often think I forgot to hit render and then I forget to get my coffee, which win or loss, I honestly couldn't tell you, not a clue. But it's also as immediately responsive as an iPad, which sounds silly until you use it and you realize how many dozens of seconds out of every minute you wasted waiting for Intel to stop beach balling or just waiting while you were dragging an effect a few frames one way or another, or, you know, down arrowing through files in quick view 
without having to wait an excruciating amount of seconds for every single image or video to render. Everything is just instant, which is such a massive quality of life improvement, even 18 months in, that it still makes me stop and just smile, at least on the daily. And with M1 Pro and M1 Max, it's basically like getting a computer and a rendering box twofer, where previously you'd export a video and it would just grind the Intel CPU to a halt in a way that it made thumbnails tough to work on or even just web browsing a hassle. And now that's all just handled by the media engines, including ProRes, leaving the CPU utterly free for any and all non-media work. And in that specific situation, it's legit like having a second Mac available to you. So you can work in parallel in a way that wasn't just not realistic before, but was incredibly frustrating. And now with M1 Ultra, we have all of that doubled again in a way that kind of makes me wish Apple wouldn't stress performance so much in their marketing because it's not really a performance story. I mean, the marketing aside, anyone, everyone would tell you that Apple Silicon can be beat, is beat on performance if and when a competitor is just willing to spend the voltage to do it. Just jack up the power to win that benchmark LARP crown from the download run and done crowd, which everyone from Intel to Qualcomm are clearly, clearly more than willing, happy even to do. But it's an efficiency story, not just how efficient Apple Silicon is or that it achieves a performance it does through that efficiency, but how efficient it enables all of us to be, how performant it lets us be through that efficiency. But as a person, human being, I'm not physically faster. I'm not typing or moving a mouse any faster through Apple Silicon, but the amount of parallelism, integration, off-core features, and overall design advantages lets me get more done than I could ever otherwise possibly do. In other words, it's not like a gas-guzzling roadster. It's a hybrid SUV that lets me move so much more, so much faster, so much better, and in a way that makes me even more curious what the multi-die scalability limits of this system, of this architecture, will really prove to be. And lest you think I'm treating the new Mac Studio as merely a bead-blasted aluminum candy shell for M1 Max and Ultra, I kind of really dig the industrial design, the whole concept as well. It's like your Apple and this light bulb goes off in your head, all incandescent, neon. There are pros who want the most powerful Mac imaginable but don't care one iota about the internal expansion slots. So you make the Vader helmet meets trash can 2013 Mac Pro, but you totally overestimate the impact, the importance of OpenCL, and at the same time, totally underestimate the saltiness, the wrath of pros for whom Mac Pro doesn't just mean power, but also modularity and expandability. So you Craig a culpa, the thermal corner, resurrect the cheese grater in the 2019 Mac Pro, and you give those salty, wrathful pros the name and the Mac that really means something to them, that means everything to them. But that light bulb is still there, like an itch in your mind. And you've already shipped a higher end Intel Mac mini, the original, the classic all in none. And that light bulb just goes full on floodlight. You don't need a Mac Pro mini. You need a Mac mini Pro. Screw that, Mac mini Max. Then you put it on Hulk Serum and make it full on ultra. And then you give it a 27 inch studio display which I'll have a whole entire video on, so don't forget to hit that subscribe button, and you make it not only the spiritual successor to the 2013 Mac Pro, but to the 2017 iMac Pro as well. Now, the M1 Max Mac Studio starts at 2,000 bucks, and the M1 Ultra at 4,000, and goes up from there, way up, if you ultra the GPU memory and storage, like 8,000 bucks up, which is kind of a really good value on the entry level, and only harshened at the top, by how low yield rates really are for two bridge dies as monolithic as M1 Ultra, even with lower end, relatively speaking, binned options and Apple's top shelf, but also top priced RAM and SSD upgrades. But still, there's nothing else like the Mac Studio. So if you're not waiting on the modular Mac Pro or holding out some last vestige of hope for an iMac Pro RIP and either need these capabilities to make way more money or just want them because you already have way more money, then have at it. Personally, I ordered an Ultra and I haven't bought a desktop Mac in maybe a decade. This is just as excited as I've been for a Mac in a decade because I kind of low key love it. Actually, I kind of all caps love it. I love having M1 Macs and M1 Ultra in an enclosure that you just couldn't get. You couldn't fit Alder Lake or Ampere into it if it was twice the size and liquid nitrogen cooled. 
And that's including the extra two pounds of copper rather than aluminum, the bigger heatsink in the M1 Ultra, because Ultra, damn. And I know I've been focusing on Ultra here because it's new and shiny, but I did a whole entire video on M1 Max when it debuted in the MacBook Pro, and I'll link to it below the like button. But either way, if you've just been waiting for that chip in a desktop enclosure, then that's pretty much what you're getting here, along with just a ton more thermal envelope to really let it run wild in. And I love having it at this size, so I don't have to stick it on the floor. I can leave it on the desk and have all that IO just immediately within reach. And I love that it's whisper quiet, and I don't care at all that it's an appliance without any internally accessible PCIe expansion slots, because that's what the Apple Silicon Mac Pro will provide, what it was always meant to provide. And I love that it's not stuck inside a display because at this point, I've been beyond spoiled by the mini LED and HDR, XDR displays in the MacBook Pro and iPad Pro anyway. And now I can get that when and if it comes next and just keep right on using the same Mac with it because that's how I think true system architecture, true scalability is supposed to work. And for more on that, check out my interview with Apple's VP of Silicon and VP of Mac product marketing, where they just say it all, explain it all right out loud. And you can watch it ad-free, sponsor-free, and the extended version on Nebula. Also exclusive and original videos, including my new studio tour series with episode one, camera gear, and episode two, mics and sound already posted, and episode three, lighting coming soon. Because on Nebula, a bunch of your favorite education creators have the absolute luxury of making videos that don't have to be optimized for YouTube at all, including bonus and extended versions of videos that I know, I just know the nerdiest, most hardcore of you will totally love. All ad-free, sponsor-free on Nebula and bundled in for free when you sign up with today's sponsor at curiositystream.com slash Richie, or just click the link below. And right now, today, because you're watching this video, you can get CuriosityStream on sale for 26% off, less than 15 bucks a year way, way less than the price of any Mac dongle for the whole entire year. And that includes their thousands of amazing documentaries and series and a whole entire section on technology that goes deep into not just the science, but the ethics of everything we're racing to invent. It is the absolute best way to support educational creators like me directly and the best damn deal in streaming today for over 26% off CuriosityStream, less than 15 bucks a year and Nebula bundled in for free, just click the button on the screen or go to curiositystream.com slash Richie. Clicking on that button really helps out the channel and so does hitting up this playlist for way more hyper detailed videos on M1, the whole M1 family and everything coming next. Just hit up that playlist and I'll see you in the next video.